the size of that log house was unusual. It was rare to do a two-story log house. Um, and uh, those of you who uh, are physically able and interested in negotiate uh, some somewhat steep stairs and uh, tight and spaces. Creek and, and unsafe banister. And unsafe banister, uh. yes. Uh, we'll have a chance to go up and see what the upper part of, of that uh, original building was uh, like today. Uh, I want to start a little, a little history of, of John Eliason's life by having you take a little imaginary trip back exactly 200 years. We're in 1823. And somewhere in Sweden or Denmark, don't know exactly where, uh, six days ago, a baby boy was born, and his name was Johann Bernd Eliasson. His family was going to move to a little village outside uh, Copenhagen. He would grow up there, and then in his early 30s, uh, we're not sure what his reasoning was, but in his early 30s, he decides to embark for America. So in 1855, in March, uh, he gets on a ship, heads to America, two and a half month trip, 79 days at sea. Hmm. Uh, ends up in June of that year uh, in New York City and starts immediately working his way westward, uh, visiting various places along the way. But by the end of the year, he had gotten to this peninsula. And uh, he looked immediately for work and he got a job down in A Harbor doing some logging work with Levi Thorpe. Uh, we know that uh, at the end of that year, in November of 1855, uh, uh, he declared his intent to be a permanent American citizen. Uh, he filed his naturalization papers that November, 1855. The next year, uh, in 1856, he was in Ephraim. Uh, two years later, he was going to buy land there 1858, and start farming. Not successful. Very rocky soil. He couldn't see that he was going to be able to make any kind of living doing that. So he turned his eyes northward to the newly formed Liberty Grove. And don't know where he came up and looked at the property at all or just got reports about it, but in 1863, he bought land in, in Liberty Grove, the land that is Ellison Bay. All of this shoreline, all the way across to Mink wow. River. Bought it from Elias Gill. Most, most of the people buying land in this area was the Northwest Territory, so you bought it from the government. But Elias Gill had been given land from the government as part of a reward for his military service, and so he had the whole sort of northern tip uh, of the peninsula. And so he was the one who then sold this land to, uh, to uh, John Eliasson. Uh, Early Liberty Grove, I mean, this was just all forest, right? Forest and swamps, largely. The lower areas, uh, the, like this, and the bays, and then from those kind of leading up inland, was a lot of swampy territory, but otherwise just, just heavily uh, forested areas. The only thing really going on here, the Potawatomi had developed a trail up all the way along the shoreline, and they had uh, a couple of tool-making sites here. One's over where, just behind where Kick Ash is today, and the other was down a little north and behind where Gills Rock Pottery uh, is. So they had those tool making sites we know. And uh, they had a couple of seasonal encampments over, over one on either side of Bink River uh, in the Rallies Bay area, or the er Erickson Point. Erickson Point. Uh, so that was going on, but otherwise uh, not a lot happening here. But the particular time that he chose to buy property, it turned out to be uh, uh, significant in one way, and that is it was just two years later that a land survey was go a surveyor was going through here and needed a name for that bay out there. And so uh, uh, the only registered owner of property in this area was John Eliasson. Uh, of course, he had to anglicize, Americanize the name somewhat, so it went from Eliasson to Ellison. Uh, those two and various spellings have coexisted all the way through to the end of his life and beyond to this day. And I'm going to refer to him as a combination, I guess, uh, not Johan, but I'm going to call him John Eliasson, so, uh, so the name confusion sort of continues. Uh, but anyway, they decided to choose his name and apply it to the bay. 
So that's how Ellison Bay makes its geographical debut on the maps. But uh, unsuspecting Eliason didn't know until two years later when somebody pointed out his name on a map that he had uh, given a name to this place. But he was an accommodating soul, and so not only did he accept the name of the town in the bay, but he also uh, accepted the, the change in spelling and started uh, using uh, Ellison, although he used both all his life, but uh, generally changed it to the E-L-L-I-S-M uh, spelling. Um, uh, we don't know a lot about him physically. We have one picture of him. Uh, and that picture, uh, he has a hat not like mine, but a sort of bowler type, but not the, you may think of a bowler with the narrow, stiff rim, but this was the wide rim, floppy kind of bowler, right, uh, that he wore. Um, and he had a, a, a local said that his sort of standard dress, not when he was doing heavy work on the farm or uh, heavy work logging and so forth, but you know, when he was the manager, he was the businessman in the, in the community. Uh, he was always well-dressed and he had a serge, blue serge suit. He had a, a blue vest, he had a light gray flannel shirt, a gray sweater, very tidy dresser. He always, the vest was always buttoned, the sweater was always buttoned up, the, uh, the watch fob was precisely across the, the vest, you know, and uh, he had uh, the Scandinavian blonde hair, which was neatly trimmed, and the neatly trimmed beard. Even uh, in his 80s, people said he still had blonde streaks in his white uh, hair. So that was the kind of figure uh, that you saw uh, wandering around this area. Uh, but he gets the land in 1863, but at that point he's merely a landowner. He's got to become a settler. And to do that, he needs three things. Uh, he needs a, a house, he needs a wife, and uh, he needs a business. And so he begins on those enterprises. The first Ellison house, this one behind me here, was not a very elaborate uh, affair. It was, it had beam ceilings, it had real wide, plain pine plank floors. Uh, it had, didn't have curtains, but it had newspapers, at least on one window we know, it had newspapers up to cover the window. And newspapers he also used to decorate, because he, he cut out, a, we know at least, that he cut out a picture of George Washington, he had that up on the wall, and he had a picture of a woman spinning wool, and he had that up. Uh, so the, that was sort of the, the decorations for the uh, house. Uh, then, uh, it was stay and, and through his life, and then for a short while after that, as they were settling the estate, and then the, the property in 1911 went to two professors, uh, James Moore and uh, Henry Jones, who almost immediately formed the Ellison Bay Land Company and then transferred that property over to the company. And it stayed in the company, and that group of other shareholders were added into that partnership over the years. Um, uh, but eventually ended up solely in the ownership of James Moore and his family and went to his daughter. So it stayed there for a long time. That gets us up to uh, the year 1970. And then the property was sold to a family from Chicago, Henry Barron, uh, came in here and they bought the property for one reason. They wanted to tear this thing down and build a motel right here along the shore. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, the interest in doing that, as the family, as Henry Barron got older, uh, sort of faded away, and so they didn't do it. But they kept the property until 1977, and guess who became the owners at that time? The, the sheriffs purchased the property, and so it's, it's been with them uh, ever since. So, uh, so we have the property, he's got that much. He needs a wife, and he gets that in uh, uh, January 7th of 1867. Marries a woman named uh, uh, Carolyn or Carolina Topp uh, from the German settlement. Her name was spelled T-A-P-P-E, -E. it was the German spelling, but like all the other things, it got changed to T-O-P-P -P and T-O-P later, but Carolyn Topp. Uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was not her maiden name. She had uh, had a previous marriage. We don't know anything about that. We don't know what her maiden name was, um, but she married John Eliason. But he needed a business. They need a business plan. Maybe he came with one, we don't know. He certainly came with a financial wherewithal to buy property. And he, that was what he did his entire life, buy property. Uh, over the, his total life, 
not any one time, but totally over his life. He owned over 8,000 acres here. Uh, to give you an idea, the, the other biggest landholder in the area was S.A. Rogers over in Rallies Bay. He owned all the land all the way around Rallies Bay. That was only 4,000 acres. Uh, so he was the grand uh, landowner in this area. But, but he needed a plan, and his plan, uh, whether he came with it or he developed it quickly, but his plan was, I got all this land, I've got to get settlers in here because I need to sell the land to get some money. I, I need to uh, uh, start clearing the land, getting the trees out of here. I, I can make money shipping the logs out, mm -hmm. and eventually I can start bringing merchandise in to sell to the people who are building the houses and coming in and settling the land. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that clearly was, was the plan. And uh, he succeeded in that uh, uh, very well. Um, I, w I want to give you a little feeling what feeling was like in the 1870s as he was growing rapidly year by year and buying other properties and developing businesses and so forth. And I just want to read you quickly just a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, he had to get those settlers in. So in 1871, he advertises for them. Let's get these people in here at Ellison Bay. Here's uh, what he put in the paper. To immigrants, persons immigrating to the West in search of new homes will do well to write and go to John Eliason, to, uh, Eliason's Bay, Door County, Wisconsin. He has some of the finest timbered farming <laughs> land in the West, <laughs> conveniently located within a short distance of a first-class pier. I frankly don't think the pier had been built at that time. So. <laughs> he, will, he will sell the lands to actual settlers on time and at reasonable prices. We know of no better chance in the Western country to get cheap homes. <laughs> he also wants to secure choppers to get out posts and other stuff to whom he will pay good wages. Be sure and write to John Eliason, Ephraim Post Office, Door County, Wisconsin. Uh, so he starts that, and of course that same year uh, he builds the pier, as I think probably after he put the advertisement, but he builds a pier and the very next spring he already has 2,000 cords of wood to ship out. So, I mean, I mean you know, when you, you clear land to build a log house, the first product you're going to have is logs, and so he was prepared to, uh, to deal with that. He also had a lot of pine and hemlock logs ready to go. Uh, in the early days of the 1870s, it was really the boom period for him and uh, almost synonymous with him for, uh, for Ellison Bay itself. And I want to read you a letter. This was late in the 1870s, 1878. This was a letter that a law reporter wrote for a Republican newspaper uh, called the Inter-Ocean. And he describes what life is like in uh, Ellison Bay. And you'll see how the life, the business, the house all kind of come together, uh, work together. So here's what he says. My wife and I started from Chicago 10 days, 10 days since on the popular Goodrich steamer Oconto. It was going to come to Ellison Bay a lot. In Ellison's, Ellison's Bay, we took on John Ellison and his wife headed to Green Bay. They were often going to Green Bay, to Milwaukee, to Racine because they had to get vessels to come in, take off the logs, they had to get vessels to bring goods in, so that was part of their, their business uh, plan. Uh, and on our return, we accepted their cordial invitation to spend a few days with them in the country. A life very different from that of the city. No railroads, no telegraph lines, no daily papers to bother us. The life of this beautiful bay is simple, yet luxurious in its way. It is almost patriarchal. The food is plain, yet good and abundant. To sit down to a long table with eight or, sturdy, or ten sturdy Swedish and Norwegian retainers of the master of the house reminds one of ancient times. We have taken long walks on the beautiful shores and bluffs, gone in swimming, boated and enjoyed the pure air and invigorating breezes that we're feeling this very moment of this most beautiful Green Bay region. Yesterday, my wife and I, attended by a sturdy Norwegian, made an excursion to Mink River, which we followed in a boat to its termination at Lake Michigan, only a few miles distant. We caught some bass and pickerel on our way. The crops in this part are better than the average. We were surprised to see the number of threshing machines and other agricultural implements shipped to this place. Now, we've gone through almost nothing in the early 80s now to all this agricultural equipment here. You know who was bringing that equipment in and selling it to everybody here? That was John Eliason. Uh, 
Settlers are continuing coming in and the woods are disappearing before their axes. The wood trade is flourishing. Well, the price is being two dollars and a half for beech, a three to three sixty for maple with fairly good sales. Supplies are abundant and everyone seems prosperous. Last night, there was a heavy rain and a wind squall here, notwithstanding which we danced in the low raftered kitchen, which we'll see, uh, men and all to the music of an accordion. And then he closes his letter out by saying, in haste to take John Ellison's carriage to Fish Creek to catch the steamer to Chicago. Uh, Ellison was gonna take care of that pretty soon. He didn't have to go to, there to get the steamer. It would come here. Uh, and he signs of William B. Silva. Silva. So we get this kind of idyllic view but we all know that that wasn't what life was really like. And so I'll give you for contrast uh, this. Um, Carl Nielsen and John Eliason were on their way to Washington Island and got caught in a blizzard and had to just seek immediate shelter in uh, an abandoned